Jesus Christ is a great worker of miracles and an unveiler of mysteries. What a wonderfully beautiful song. Thank you, Sam and Miss Page, for learning that to encourage our hearts this morning about the mysterious, wonderful, amazing love of our Lord. You see, even though Christ is a great worker of miracles, I'm convinced His greatest miracle is not the miracle of the human body, as great as that is. I'm convinced this morning the greatest miracle is not how He scooped out the oceans of the world or how He raised up the mountain peaks. I am convinced that His greatest miracle is not the miraculous healings of the body, as wonderful as that is. No, I'm convinced this morning, if I'm convinced of anything, that the greatest mystery of all time is that a holy God who is boundless in His perfection, who is matchless in His righteousness, would have anything whatsoever to do with sinful, wicked, wretched, evil men like your pastor and the other men and women in this building this morning. And the mystery of it is this. Not, he, he did not merely respond when I called out to him and asked him for mercy. He knew that I would not come and I would not call. So he came and he called. And what a wonderful, merciful, mysterious God that we serve. That's really the theme of our 16th lesson in the Gospel of John. We've been studying John's gospel record on Sunday mornings under the title I Believe. John writes so that we can believe the right things about Jesus and find eternal life in Him. And The, the, the mystery of mercy is really what's on display in John chapter 5. If you would turn in your Bibles there to John chapter 5, we're going to be studying verses 1 through 18. And what we find here is that Jesus was and still is in the miracle working business. Yes, yes He is. I'm telling you this morning, the great physician... He hasn't retired, sold his practice, hung out his shingle. He's still the Jehovah Rapha of the Old Testament, the God who heals. And in John chapter 5, we find Jesus making his way back to the holy city of Jerusalem for a religious feast, a Jewish festival, if you please. And there he encounters a man who's been lame for 38 years. For the better part of four decades, this man has had some form of paralysis that has robbed his legs, perhaps his arms, of the ability to move. Yet when the Savior is done with him, he is up and he is walking around and he is in the temple testifying that the one who touched my body and changed my life is none other than Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now as we move through this story in the 18 verses of our text this morning, I want you to keep your focus where your focus belongs. It's not on the lame man. It's not on the multitude of other halt, crippled, lame, blind people that were not healed that day. The the focus is not even on the Pharisees that began to criticize Jesus for doing this great work on the Sabbath. No, the focus of this text and the focus of all of John's gospel is on the Lord Jesus Christ. John tells us in that key passage back in chapter 20 and verse 31 that these things, including this passage, including the record of this miracle, these things have been written. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in His name. Now with that in mind, I want to ask the question that Jesus poses to this crippled man. I want to ask you this morning, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Would you stand with your Bibles open to honor the reading of the perfect Word of God? I'm reading this morning from the New American Standard Bible. If you're on a smart device, you may find it listed as NASB. Listen to the perfect word of our God. And after these things there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame and withered waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water And whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well or do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to... Get me into the pool where the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Well, of course he did. (laughs) 
And now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? And the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And I pray heaven would add a blessing to the reading of the perfect Word of God as we take our seats this morning. I want to encourage you to go ahead and engage your mind to worship the Lord. There's deep theological water down by the pool of Bethesda. And this is not going to be the kind of message where you'll be tempted to stand in your pew, shake your Bible, or throw babies from the balcony. I need you to make a commitment right now that you will worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. Uh, You see, when we get to the end of the passage this morning and where I believe God wants to take us, if you've not been paying close attention and disciplining yourself intellectually, then when we get where we're going, you're not going to know where we're at. And so I want you to pay very close attention this morning. In fact, when the sermon is over, if you're not inclined to say, now that was preaching, (laughs) you've just identified yourself as being feeble-hearted and weak-minded. So everybody's going to be saying they love the sermon this morning. Do you want to be healed? There are three characteristics in this passage that I believe characterize every miracle that Jesus ever performs, those of the body, and more importantly, those of the soul. Notice with me, first of all, the condition of the lame. Jesus encounters a man in a very serious condition, and as serious as his condition is physically, it is a picture, a a symbol, a, a prototype, if you will, of his spiritual condition. As we examine the condition of this lame man, I want you to see, can you not identify with him? Is this not the spiritual condition of every father's child and every mother's baby? Consider, first of all, in verses 1 through 3, the place where he was. The Bible says that Jesus makes his way up to the city of Jerusalem for a feast. We, we don't know exactly which feast it was. There were numerous religious festivals through the course of the Jewish year, and Jesus attended them on a regular basis, by the way. Uh, It may be interesting to you to know that Jesus came to Jerusalem from Cana of Galilee. That's where chapter 4 closes. Now church, that's 160 kilometers, almost exactly 100 miles that Jesus walked. If I could say it like this, he walked to church because it was the appointed time of worship. The regularity with which Jesus attended the temple and the sacrifice of body and money that it cost him to get there is an indictment against the fact that many of God's people won't come down a paved road to an air-conditioned building, walk down a carpeted aisle to sit on a padded pew and listen to a good-looking preacher preach the gospel. Uh, What? That wasn't supposed to be funny. Jesus made an investment to worship God his father. And as he comes into the city of Jerusalem to observe the religious feast, he comes to a place called Bethesda. It was located between the temple and a gate in the wall of the city of Jerusalem known as the Sheep Gate. These places are all very, very important for the context of this story. You see, the Sheep Gate was a very important gate in the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, a well-fortified, high-walled city. And on the northern wall around the city of Jerusalem there were two different gates one was called the fish gate and the other was called the sheep gate because Jesus is coming up to Jerusalem from the north up in the sense that Jerusalem is an elevated location most likely Jesus entered in at the sheep gate the sheep gate was so named because since the construction of the temple uh, the shepherds who were bringing their sheep into the holy city to 
to sell them at the marketplace, to be utilized in the sacrificial system of temple worship, they would bring their sheep in through the sheep gate. And located nearby the sheep gate was a pool, the pool of Bethesda. Worshippers would not only enter in at the sheep gate and make their way toward the temple, but they would stop by the pool of Bethesda for a time of ritual or ceremonial cleansing. It is there that Jesus encounters this man who has been lame and ill in his body for 38 years. Now when John says that all of this happened by the sheep gate at the pool of Bethesda, a place with five porticos, this is more than just a geographical footnote. Do you remember that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness? What I mean is there are no extra or unnecessary words in the Bible. This miracle could have happened anywhere, but the Holy Spirit sees fit to tell us about the place where this man was. The sheep gate was very important to the people of Jerusalem because it typified the shedding of blood that would take place in the temple, a picture of the lamb that would soon come. I'm talking about the lamb of God that was actually slain before the foundation of the world was, but, but was coming and stepping into time to be slain on the altar of Calvary's cross. The sheep gate was so important to temple worship and to the people of Jerusalem that when Nehemiah led the rebuilding effort centuries before the text we read today, the very first thing they did was they rebuilt the sheep gate. When Nehemiah began the reconstruction effort of the Jerusalem city walls, the first thing they did, we would say they set the post for the sheep gate and Nehemiah called on a man named Eliashib, the priest, to come with other priests and reestablish and set the sheep gate. We read that in Nehemiah 3 and verse 1. And Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brothers the priests and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up its doors. And at this place where lambs have come to slaughter for literally centuries through that gate comes the very Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. And on his way between the gate and the temple he stops by the pool of Bethesda the word Bethesda in the Hebrew means the house of mercy. We would say it in Hebrew, the, the house of chesed. Chesed is the Hebrew word for mercy. Sometimes translated the house of compassion, the house of love, or the house of grace. Each of these conveying essentially the same meaning. The pool was near the temple because folks would stop by there for their ceremonial cleansing and the performance of a religious ritual. And it is here that Jesus selects and John records the, the miracle of sovereign mercy. The pool of Bethesda was surrounded by five porches. And before we move on from the description of the place, I want to just give you an interesting little tidbit. At the end of verse 2, the Holy Spirit just drops in this little note, having five porticos, having five porches. That, that really seems somewhat unnecessary to the rest of the story. It is on one level insignificant that the pool of Bethesda had five porches. So why does the Holy Ghost just drop that in? I, I believe there could be a number of reasons. One of them is quite interesting to this preacher. You see, skeptics came along after the gospel of John began to be accepted as inspired scripture. And the skeptics said, no, there's no way that the apostle John could have written that gospel account. They, they said there, there are too many notes in there and historical uh, 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 notes that, that, that John could not have written this. And one of the things that they used to criticize John's authorship of this gospel is this little note about five porches. You see, at this time in Jewish history, the Jews did not build things in the shape of a pentagon. There, there were no five-sided pools that we read reference of in any uh, ancient writings, no, no, no pentagon-shaped pools had been unearthed. And that was the line of the skeptic and the scoffer until the early part of the 19th century, the 1800s. And then they unearthed a large rectangular-shaped pool that was just inside the sheep gate, between the sheep gate and the temple. And they began unearthing this large rectangular shaped pool. Now I don't mean to lose you in the geometry, but a rectangular shaped pool only has four sides. And the skeptic said, aha, <laughs> there weren't five porches at the pool of Bethesda. It was rectangular in shape, just as all the other pools of the day were. But as they kept digging, 
they found that in that large rectangular shaped pool there was another porch, a covered sidewalk if you please that cut that pool in half. Now picture this, imagine looking at a digital clock and the number 8, there was a large rectangular shaped pool, four sides, four porches going around the perimeter of that pool and then a fifth porch just cutting it right in half. And, and I believe that the Holy Spirit just simply said, John I want you to put a little time capsule of authenticity. I want you to just nestle away this little phrase because the day is going to come Folks won't believe that you wrote this book because you mentioned five porches and about 1,800 years after you live, they're going to do a little bit of digging and it's going to be an archaeological attestation that you, folks, you can trust your Bible to be the inspired, the infallible, and the inerrant Word of God. That's not even in my sermon today. That's absolutely free. The place where it was. Notice the second thing about this lame man's condition and that is the problem that he had in verses 3 through 5, the scripture simply says this man was laying along with a multitude of those who were sick, blind, halt, and lame. I actually like the way the King James translation phrases this. For the King's English actually says that there was a multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, and withered. In other words, the word impotent or sick is the major word. And uh, blind, halt, and withered, those are just variations of this impotent, infirm condition. In other words, each of them was powerless. Some were powerless because they were blind. Some were powerless because they were halt or lame or crippled. Some were powerless because they were withered, which speaks of the paralysis of the hand. Some were powerless to see what they needed to see. Some were powerless to walk like they needed to walk. Some were powerless to work like they needed to work. But all of them were equally impotent, all equally powerless. And I want you to notice the picture of grace here. Here at the doorstep of religion, laying beside the pools of ritualistic, Judaistic worship in what we might call the shadow of the steeple. Are blind people who needed their eyes open, lame people who needed their feet strengthened, and halt people who needed their bodies empowered. And there they waited and waited and waited and waited. A.W. Pink, the great preacher and commentator, said, Who but the Spirit of God could have drawn so marvelously accurate a picture of us in such a few short lines? This man's condition, surrounded by all of his crippled friends, is a picture of several things, including it's a picture of ancient Israel and the dead religion that characterized their worship. It is a picture of the truth that we saw back in chapter 1, that Christ is going to come into his own and his own will not receive him. But before we get too hard on ancient Israel, it is equally a picture of us. Lean in close and listen carefully. The inability of this man to help himself The inability of his friends who were in the same condition to help him is a picture of a lost man without Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is a picture of every person who has ever been born inheriting the sin of our great, 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 great grandfather Adam. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. Death entered the world by way of sin. And now death has spread to all men because all have sinned. I'm saying... That if you are lost, you are this lame man. And if you're saved, you used to be just like him. It should be noted there's legitimate debate surrounding verse 4's inclusion in the Bible. And that's why some of you may have it footnoted, bracketed, or italicized in some way. But the larger point remains that whether their belief that this angel would stir up the water, whether or not that belief was sound or superstitious, They waited by the pool of religion for a solution to their problem. This man had waited 38 years. That's 456 months. 13,880 days. If he lay there for 8 hours a day, he was there for over 111,000 hours. Notice this lame man's condition because through the gate where sacrificial lambs enter, Walks the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And he stops by the house of mercy. And he meets a man that cannot do one blessed thing for himself. And he seeks him out laying beside the pool of dead, lifeless 
religion. The lame man's condition, we see it in the place where he was and the problem that he had. Then in verses 6 and 7, notice with me the profession that he made. Jesus walks over to this lame man. And by the way, notice in verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition. Church, when Jesus sees you this morning, he already knows your condition. You may as well go ahead and acknowledge and admit what it is. You're not going to surprise him. He already knows about the sin you're committing. He already knows about the burden that you're carrying. He already knows about the situation in which you find yourself today. And Jesus looked at this man, saw him, knew exactly what was wrong with him and how long he had been there. And Jesus asked what seems to be a rather obvious question. You want to get better? Would you like to be made well? Would you like to be healed? And I want you to notice what the man does not say. He does not say, yes, I would. He does not say, could you heal me? He does not say, oh, you must be Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, I believe upon you. No, he begins showing us where his faith had been up to that point. Sir, I can't get any better. I don't have anybody to help me. And when I try to get in by myself, I can't get there until somebody beats me into the pool. He's relying on his own strength. He's relying on the strength of his friends. And he's even relying on the waters which represent the waters of good works and dead religion. And yet, Jesus seeks him out, singles him out, and heals the man. This lame man's condition, you may be laying by that Bethesda pool today. As a Lamb of God comes into this building in the person and power and presence of the Holy Spirit. He sees you in your sin sick and soul sore condition. And he sent me here to ask you this morning... Do you want to get well? You want to be made better? The condition of the lame. Notice the second main truth, and that is the command of the Lord. In verses 8 through 14, we find that Jesus begins this miraculous encounter, and Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And that's exactly what the man began to do. One word from the word made flesh and everything about this man's body began to change. Notice with me first of all in verses 8 through 13, Jesus cured his disease. Jesus did for this man what no religious ritual had ever done or could ever do. And Jesus did it with a simple word. And Jesus said to him. He's able to do that, you know. He said, let there be light and stars and light started shining. Jesus healed people a lot of different ways. On one occasion, we'll get to in John's gospel, he healed a blind man by spitting into the dirt, making some mud, said, here's mud in your eye, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man did that and came away seeing. On another occasion, uh, Jesus healed a woman when he just walked by and allowed her in mercy to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And Jesus said, who touched me? I felt healing virtue go out of my body. Jesus healed a lot of people a lot of different ways. He stopped a funeral processional in Luke chapter 17, looked into the casket and said, Son, arise. He said to a dead little 12-year-old girl in the back room at her daddy's house, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And he said down by the grave of Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus healed people a lot of different ways, but I'm convinced his favorite way was just to speak a word. That's what he does with this man. Get up. Pick up your pallet and walk. Now I want you to notice with me, Jesus did this not because of who the lame man was. Don't don't miss this. Jesus did not do what he did because of who the lame man was. Jesus did what he did because of who Jesus was. The lame man didn't say, oh Jesus, while on others thou art calling, don't pass me by. Jesus sought the man out, initiated conversation with him. And then Jesus did for the man what Jesus did because Jesus is who Jesus is. Now this begs the question. Why didn't Jesus heal all of them? 
The Bible clearly says there were a multitude of sick people there. Why did he not heal all of them? Now I want you to just get out a pen and a piece of paper. I want you to write this down. This is profound. I don't know. Could he have? Sure. He could have healed all of them with that same word. All of you get up. But he didn't do that. Why didn't he? I don't know. I also don't understand why two men sitting in the same service, listening to the same music, the same prayers, hearing the same sermon, one can be bored out of, out of his mind and the other's under deep conviction. I, I don't understand how two women sitting in the same service, experiencing the exact same hour of worship when the invitation is given, one is looking at their watch, wondering if they still got time to beat the Presbyterians over to the Oak Plaza, and the other is wondering when he's, when, when he's going to hush and start singing, i got to get to the altar. One hits the doors, one hits their knees. I don't understand why that is, but you know what? I don't have to. I just preach the text as it comes, and here we find Jesus goes in, singles out, and selects a man to be the recipient of his mercy. Doesn't do it for everybody, does it for one, and in so doing, Christ is glorified as a great physician. Now, we see Jesus Christ cured his disease. Then we notice, secondly, that Jesus confronted his disobedience. He confronted his disobedience. Christ told this man to pick up his mat and walk. Why did Jesus do that? The man didn't need that mat anymore. That's the mat that lame people use. That was the pallet of the paralytic. He didn't need it anymore. I believe, listen carefully, I believe Jesus is picking a fight with the Pharisees. You see, if they had just seen this man walking around the temple in the midst of the crowd, he would not, he wouldn't have looked any different than anybody else. But now on the Sabbath day, carrying that pallet, now that caused quite a stir. Jesus is picking a fight with the Pharisees. He is bringing this little incident to a head. And after this man encounters the legalistic Pharisees, Jesus goes and finds the man in the temple. We read of that in verse 14. And the Bible says that Jesus said to the man, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore. Jesus found the man down by the pool of Bethesda, and now he finds him in the temple. The question should be asked, Why was the man in the temple? I think there are a number of reasons, but perhaps he was there offering a thanksgiving offering. Maybe he was in the temple offering a sacrifice and an offering of gratitude. By the way, that's a good thing to do, you know. Psalm 136 verse 1, we sang a few moments ago, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. The the Bible says it is fitting, it is right for God's people to praise Him. I want you to listen to your preacher this morning. If God never did one other thing for you, He's already done enough for you, especially if you're saved. He's done enough that you ought to spend all of your tomorrows and this very day with a song of worship and a song of praise upon your lips. It is a good thing to sing praise to our God. And maybe this man has gone to the temple because for the first time in almost 40 years he's been able to walk and he's just got to go and give God some glory. Maybe Psalm 103 verse 2 is in his mind. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Maybe he's doing what Hebrews 13, 15 would later describe. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips giving thanks to To his name. I want you to notice this. Here's a man standing in the temple, perhaps giving thanks for what Christ has done for him, even though at this point he doesn't even know who he is. And Jesus walks up to him and says, This. Are you listening? I said, Jesus walks up and says, This. Are you listening to me? You want to come to the house of God at the appointed time of worship and show God gratitude for what he's done in your life? Stop sinning. Yes, we should show God gratitude in here. But we show Him as great or perhaps even greater gratitude by what we do out there. Jesus said, your condition has been made better. You've been made well. In the Greek New Testament, it's in the perfect tense, which means that it is settled, it is done. That no chance whatsoever of that halt condition coming back on you. Not, not going not to be a relapse of that condition. If you know that's a settled deal, done 
End of story. You've been made well, but now you want to show God that you're grateful for what He's done for you? Stop sinning. I find there are a lot of people in the world today, far too often you're preacher. Far too often I'm in this category. We want God to help stop our suffering, but we're not too interested in stopping the sinning. Paul addresses this in Romans 12, verse 1, when he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That is, because God has poured out mercy upon you. Here's what you ought to do. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice unto God. And By the way, he says, that's your reasonable act of worship. You want to tell God how thankful you are for his mercy? Don't bring him the blood of a bull, a goat, or a ram, or a turtle dove. Jesus has already been the one and only sacrifice that we need to, to be slain on our behalf. And when he got through offering himself, the writer of Hebrews says he went and he sat down at the right hand of God. But now if you want to show gratitude for what Christ has done for you, present your very body a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. Jesus found this man and said, son... You want to show God that you're grateful. Stop sinning. He cured his disease. He confronted his disobedience. And then he did it in verse 14 because he cared for his destiny. Jesus said in the 14th verse, Stop your sinning or else something worse is going to happen to you. What in the world could it be? Some have surmised that the, that the man's physical condition was going to get worse, but the verb tense of Jesus' declaration that you've been made well means that's a settled issue. I believe Jesus has something different in mind, and here's why. At this point in the story, there's no indication that the man was actually saved. Now, his physical condition is a picture of a lost man, but at this point in the story, he's just beginning to understand who Jesus is. He's not yet repented of his sin and believed upon Christ. And Jesus said, son, if you don't repent of your sin, something's going to happen to you that will make 38 years of paralysis look like a sunshiny day in the park. I believe Jesus is letting this man know the same thing he said over in Luke 13 and verse 3, except ye repent. You shall perish. Jesus is telling this man, I've come, I've healed your body to make a platform to tell you this. Unless you repent of your sin, you will die lost and spend forever in hell. Jesus' confrontation here is clear indication that he's more interested in holiness than healing. The condition of the lame. The command of the Lord. Third and final thing we notice in this text is the criticism of the leaders. You'd think everybody would be happy about this, but you'd be wrong. The ancestors of the Baptists were there. One writer says that the one who surrenders to his Lord must expect to encounter criticism. The one who regulates his life by the word of God will be met by the opposition of man. And the religious world that, it is the religious world that will oppose him most fiercely. And these men are so concerned that the man is carrying his pallet, walking around with his rolled up mat up under his arm. They can't even glorify God for the miracle that's taken place before their eyes. Notice, for example, here in the 15th verse, the miracle that they dismissed. Verse 15. The man has gone back and told them it was Jesus who made them well. In verse 15, for uh, this reason, verse 16, for this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now, I'm thankful we don't have a lot of this here at Emmanuel, hardly any at all in fact. But if you've ever been a part of a growing church where folks are getting saved and lives are being transformed, marriages being put back together, the waters of the baptistry are being stirred. And after, I mean, just a tremendous revival service, you get out in the lobby and somebody says, Man, it was cold in there. Oh, the choir was so loud. Oh, the sermon was so long. Oh, they didn't do my favorite kind of music. What do you think about this item in the budget? We're having conference tonight. 
By the way, let me hasten to remind you, I'm thankful we don't have all that junk here, but some of you have been in churches where it happens that way, and when you encounter a person like that in the hallway, in the lobby, in the parking lot, you've met the descendants of these folk. they got kinfolk with us today. The miracle they dismissed. By the way, even though I don't think that is necessarily a point of current application for a manual, here's one that is. There are a lot of churches that think, man, if we could just have something powerful, sensational, almost miraculous happen, everybody would believe. No, they won't. Boy, if the, if the choir would just, I mean, make the rafters ring, even though we don't have rafters. Oh, if the sermon was just more energetic and, and, and just better presented. Oh, oh if, if the soloist would do, oh, if they would do a little more of this and, and a little less of that. Maybe, maybe if we'd have this powerful emotional service, bring the lights down and, 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 and get us a fog machine and some pyrotechnics. Build a pit up here underneath the pulpit and let me come up at the appointed time on a hydraulic lift. It's time now for the preaching of the Word of God. Oh boy, if we could do that, listen to me friend, that'll draw a crowd. But you could take a lame man that everybody knows hadn't been able to walk under his own power for almost four decades, have him up walking around if the power of Almighty God it not the place, the folks are just going to get mad and won't even believe it at all. There's the miracle they dismissed. And because of that in verse 17, there's the murder that they devised. Verse 17 and 18, Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working, and for this reason the Jews were working all the more to kill him. You see, their complaint involved the Sabbath. And you may not see it on the surface of your English Bibles, but Jesus actually answers their question about the Sabbath. He says, My father is working until now. He said, The father's working on the Sabbath. You want to know why I'm working on the Sabbath? Because the father is working on the Sabbath. The Sabbath. You go back in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, and when the Bible says that God saw everything that He had done and that it was good, the Bible says that God rested. But I want you to I want you to make very make a very important distinction. God rested from His creative work and from His His labor of making stuff, but God did not cease to work His compassionate acts of mercy. If God had just sat down and done nothing, nobody would have been putting oxygen in Adam's lungs. If God had stopped doing anything, the birds would have quit singing, the, the grass would have stopped growing, the, the stars and all of the, uh, of the celestial bodies would, would, would have cast themselves down. God, God didn't just stop doing anything at all on the Sabbath. Oh, no. Jesus makes it clear in the other Gospels that He, Christ, is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And He says here, you want to know why I'm doing work on the Sabbath? By the way, God the Father is doing this same work. I just did it because that's what the Father was doing. And nestled in there, he makes a statement. My father. The Pharisees would have never spoken in such a familiar way about the one true God. They would speak of him as our father. If they ever said my father, they would add some type of title or descriptor to kind of separate the familiarity of it. Our, our father who is in heaven, my father. Father who, who, who led us out of Egypt, they would say things like this, but they would never simply say, my Father. And they understand Jesus is making himself equal with God. And he says this, I'm doing the same thing that my Father is doing. He says, I'm here on a co-mission with the Father. And they tried to kill him. Now I want you to notice the irony as we move toward concluding this morning. Jesus said, I'm here on a mission of mercy I'm doing exactly what God my Father is doing. And they said, you must die. And Jesus said, that's what I'm talking about. That's why I'm here. It's the only thing they were right about all day long. The murder they devised. The miracle 
they dismissed. And then finally there's the message they discerned. The Bible says at the end of the 18th verse, but also he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now as we close, I want you to pay very close attention to something. Their failure is not that they did not understand what Jesus was saying. They understood exactly what he was saying. They just refused to believe it. And so it is with a lost man. Oh, it's not that you don't understand that I'm telling you Christ died on the cross for your sins and was physically raised from the dead and turning from your sin and turning to Christ is your only hope to be saved. Listen, that, that's not rocket science. It's not that a lost man cannot understand what I'm saying. It's that in his sick, spiritual, dead spiritual condition, he refuses to believe. The truth is that unless the same God that opened the eyes of Bartimaeus opens your eyes, you'll never see what you need to see. Unless the same God that opened the ears of the deaf unstops your spiritual ears, you'll never hear what you need to hear. And unless the same sweet Lamb of God stops by your pool of Bethesda like he stopped by this man and gives you strength to believe and respond, you will never respond to the gospel. I want you to listen to your preacher this morning. Someone here in this building, you may be a church member. You may be in the temple. You may be laying by the pool of religion. But you've never genuinely repented of your sin and believed the gospel of our dear Lord. And I want to ask you today very simply, do you want to be made well? Let's pray. Father, in mercy, would you do in this place what you did in that place nearly 2,000 years ago? Send the precious person of the Holy Spirit to stop by to quicken our hearts. Show us the truth of the gospel that we may repent and believe on Christ. We ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen.